Hello everyone. I'm in a new setup today. Let's see. Let me shift over this way a bit. Okay, this is the right place. All right, so that's good. Hey, what's up? How's it going? All right, let me shift the chat over. I'm testing something out today, believe it or not. Let's see, channel view dashboard. Here we go. Hey, what's up? Okay, so for those who have been following the stream for a bit, basically one of the challenges that I've had is I've been working off the, the MacBook Pro and it's had a bunch of issues when it comes to just streaming and this kind of stuff. Hey, what's up, Thesis? You know what? I got to figure out a way to prop this up so I can see chats. I think this will work. Okay. So believe it or not, right now I am streaming entire. This is the MacBook Air. And so I'm currently just going to test it on a single monitor. I have the mic hooked up here. The camera could, prob could definitely use some work. It's just using the laptop one, but we're going to test it out. And so this is like my mobile setup because I've also loved to see how easy it is for me to travel and still stream. And uh, so far, I think so far looking so good. So with that, all right. So welcome to session four of Building with Ben. Today, we are going to be talking about Nuxt.js. Most more specifically, we're going to be talking about the new Nuxt image, which for those who haven't heard, it's basically this module that Nuxt recently released that really makes having optimized images inside of your web sites, web pages, like it just makes it a 10 times easier. And so one of the things I want to do is uh, go ahead and actually just show by example. And we're actually going to use this, uh, apply this into my own site because let's, uh, let's talk about, I think, one of the biggest challenges when it comes to developers and building their own sites, portfolios, slash blogs. The problem ultimately boils down to, let's, let me go ahead and open up VS Code. Let me open up the Ben Code Zen project. All right. So some of you have, if you've seen some of my past work, you'll know that I actually use Nux content to manage basically everything inside of the blog. And in a lot of ways, this is super nice because what you end up getting is you get the ability to control, which is like this headless CMS. But again, headless CMS is a really fancy way of saying there's a folder of markdown files in your GitHub repo. And that is what gets populated inside of your blog. And so for me, this was like really, really powerful because this is great. I don't have another integration I have to learn about. But here's the thing though. So here, when we go to my blog right now, which gosh, do, does it need some TLC, which for those who don't know the acronym, tender love and care, you see it's pretty minimal. And more importantly, I haven't written in it in a little while, partly because I, the infrastructure has frustrated me, hence, although anyways, that's a separate matter. But one of the things is that I've kept it fairly minimal. And more importantly, even when images were being added, I always had a little bit of guilt in the back of my mind because for those of us who've been developing web for a while, when it comes to responsive design, you really want to be able to deliver the smallest payload as possible to your user. And for those who've been doing image optimization, it's tricky, right? So if we look at responsive images, there's a great CSS post. I like the CSS tricks actually that Chris Koye wrote. And so I'm going to ahead and drop that actually in the channel. Let's see. So it looks like I can't fully do it on the phone right now. So I'll switch over here, drop it in here. Okay, let me just go ahead and can I, okay, I'll mute, pause, great. Okay, so when we're taking a look at responsive images, you'll notice that we have this, like, we have this need to, like, do different source sets, which means you need to learn how to write, like, how things are going to be displayed at different, like, devices. And so this requires basically learning an entire spec in terms of making sure that one, that depending on the resolution of the browser, you're going to have different images that you're going to display, which is nice. But then this gets tricky now because this means you have to manage a lot of different aspects. This means, for example, your image, you have to not only generate multiple sizes, you might have to resize them a certain way, or maybe need to display in different contexts in different ways. And so you can imagine that even in this case, like a single baby image, if you have if you know that you need to serve it on devices, let's say you decide on five different breakpoints and you're like, okay, I need to generate those. That means this image alone has five different breakpoints you need to generate. Then beyond that, within the code, you then need to actually go ahead and define like, when do you want the source set to show a certain way? Because maybe certain contexts like display things differently. And it actually very quickly scales to become very hard to manage. And so there's a lot of services that have started to help out with this kind of service. Like one of the ones that I'm most familiar with is Cloudinary, for example. 
And so they basically provide you like, like this API that you can hit where you upload the images and then they're the ones like, as you can see here with this simple query, you'd be like with the width of and height of 350 and do this, it'll automatically do all the, not only the resizing and generation, but it'll also go ahead and it, it, like basically it'll optimize it for you too. That's the other thing too, right? Because there's image optimization in addition to resizing and those sort of things. And so if we look at some of the more like blog blogs out there, and so let's just do, let's say Smashing Magazine, they have a great site. And so for a lot of things, you'll notice that a lot of these, let's see, the bump, sure, let's take a look at Stephanie's. So here you'll notice we have a lot of text here and then we have different images along the blog. And sometimes, especially with things, but actually Medium usually often has a lot of blog posts where images are a super big part of it. Here, let's see, sure, let's look at the, let's just take this particular top, topic in mind. It's actually really common to want to include like images for like featured covers and those sort of things. But if every time you write a blog post, you not only have to attach the image, but then you have to resize everything and generate all that, that is a lot of work. And then if you're like, we could use a third party service, that's great, but that's also work that a dev developer would have to do basically for their own personal site. And Nuxt image um, helps to basically fix this uh, workflow. So let's go ahead and yeah, let's do some coding and show how this works. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into, actually, you know what, I don't need the terminal. I'll just do everything from VS Code right now. Okay, so right now I have my project. So I'm gonna run my Ben Code Zen site here. We're gonna run it locally. And oh, I'm gonna open my, uh, let's see, we have, da -da, I need to do the build with Ben, session four, great. I've done that, so I know what I'm doing for today. Checked all that out. This is great, excellent. I've done this stuff, start Obsidian. Look, it's working so well. It's so smooth right now. Yeah, I, I may really want to consider using an M chip for streaming. Anyhow, before I, all right. So now that we have this, we're going to go ahead and open up our local build. So here we have Ben code Zen, a couple things need to be changed, but let's go ahead and go over to the blog. So if I look inside of the 2020 retrospective here, we have an image. So let's go ahead and inspect it real quick. We'll see here that with this image, I have something that has an intrinsic size of 2048 by 1536 pixel. Gosh, this is embarrassing because even at the max desktop width size, I'm basically saying that it will never be larger than the rendered size here, which is 676 by 500. So this is very sad. I should not be delivering such a big image. And so let's fix this using next image. So I'm going to go ahead. Let's go. Oh, whoops. Let's go over into my VS code editor. And I'm going to go ahead and actually, why did I stop the dev server? Oh, I know why. Okay. So what we're going to do is let me make sure this branch is clean. What got modified? Static components, images. Oh, looks like I already started some of this work, but we're just going to, I think we're just going to blow through it. All right, let's just, I'm just going to burn. We're just going to check it all out. That might have been a mistake, but we're going to, I want to actually walk through it together with everyone. Okay, so let's make sure everything still works because, oh, I think I remember what was the problem, but it's okay, we're gonna fix it together. All right, so we're starting it up. Okay, great. So here we have it here, we have the blog, we have the retrospective, excellent. Okay, everything's still working as expected. So if we want to get started with Nux image, it's fairly straightforward. We just go ahead and install it using the yarn add command. So inside of here, let's go ahead and now stop our server. I'm going to bump up the font size actually a little bit so it's easier for people to see. And then let's go ahead and add Nux image into our pipeline. And so now that we have this, now that that's installed, I'm going to go ahead and configure that inside of our Nux config. And so basically it's a new build module that we're adding because um, basically my site is always, basically we want to build a static site. And so we're using build modules. So here I'm just going to add the next image. And then uh, just to keep things consistent, I will give the link to the docs here. So we'll grab that. And then, so you can see here next image, add it to build modules, great. And then I'm going to add the target static though, just to be very explicit right here. Okay, and I think with that, let's make sure everything still works as expected. So yarn, everything's good, yarn dev. 
Okay. So far, looking promising. Ba -ba. All right, great. All right, so everything's looking good so far. Learn, learn pages broke. Oop, everything's, oop, things are breaking. What is going on? Refresh. The components, all I did was install something. Let's see, target static server side development. Yep, 2.15. All right, let's open it again. Port 3000. This is great. No errors. Open blog. And it's botched. Why is it? Yeah, why is it like this? I can't figure this out. All we've done is add the image, next image. We've updated the package. This file should not be version controlled. That's not good. All right, so we got to remove that out. Okay, so let me just go ahead and do a config, add next image. Okay, great. What is it not like? It doesn't like yarn lint. This is the concern with all this stuff. Okay, yarn lint, error controlled, eslintjs.rc. Okay, yarn ESN fix. What else we got? We have blog post list. Oh, there's an error here with blog post list. Okay, so this is an error I'm gonna need to fix. Let's, this is actually probably the problem. Blog post list, let's go ahead and take a look. It's saying that it doesn't like the filter aspect. So let's go ahead and look for the dot filter in here, which is here. The item here, okay. So I think it's because if there is nothing being returned, it's just like erroring out. So I'm gonna switch this is statement to say basically that return, we'll do a ternary where basically if should publish is true, then we return item, else return false. So I'm just gonna minimize that into one line like this. Okay, so now that we have that, let's, maybe that's actually what was causing the build error. Okay, that's good. Ba -bum -bum -bum. All right, let's go ahead and check this out. Hey, what's up, Mazadeep? Should I return should publish? Oh yeah, that's true. That is an excellent point. Hey, what's up, Alex? Returns should publish. Yeah, that actually could be good enough. That would be simple enough. Let's go and rerun that. It's funny though, it's getting hung up on manifest recur JSON timed out. Okay, so I have a suspicion that this little static thing is not working correctly. So let me clear that out. Start it over. I just wanna show. All right, 3000. This is good. But then once it hits another page, it just crashes on the manifest, which is really sad. Okay, hold on, let's just do a quick incognito. All right, whatever. Okay, there's something clearly. Oh, okay, hang on. Let's learn how to fix this. So I believe basically something's being cached. I bet you it's a service worker that really shouldn't be here. Oh my God, there's so many service workers being. I just need, I'm just gonna, is it any cookies in here? Just gonna wipe it out. Oh, manifest. Can I reset? Whatever. All right. We're not going to worry about that on the stream right now. The important thing here. What's up, Davidron? Hello, Cassidy. Alex, what am I using to switch between windows? Go to storage and clear all. Oh, yes. Okay. That's what I thought it was as well, but. Ba -bum -bum -bum. Okay. Refresh. Three. Okay. I do want to answer Alex's question once assuming this did not under application. That's. Oh, okay. Hang on. Mazadeep coming in with the clutch. Okay, let me go ahead and bump this up a little bit. You're saying 
Yep, I'm in application. I believe I've cleared all this. My guess is it's the manifest that's broken because it's something to do with service workers. Oh, clear this. Oh, that's probably what it is frozen. Switch back. Learn that didn't do anything. Clear, including clearing. All right, I'm just going to close the window, reopen it up. Because clearly it's working in incognito. Okay, we're not going to wrestle with this right now. Alex's question. So how am I switching between windows? It's an excellent question. Let me introduce you to Keyboard Maestro. Actually, I've been trying to do this thing where how do I switch between applications? And boom. So there's like a little marker for like time stamping. So basically, Keyboard Maestro is unfortunately a Mac-only application. But basically what it allows you to do is design keyboard bindings for how you want things to open. And so a lot of us, like when we're switching between things, um, assuming we're not doing like the tab functionality, which again, to me, is like a little, it's hard because it's hard to be efficient with that because sometimes things rotate and they don't work to me instinctively other than the last one. So I like the fact that I want to be able to access everything within two key presses. So rather than having to be like command space, Chrome, Firefox, or whatever, usually there's going to be a series of applications you use so often that you want to bind them within basically two keystrokes. And so what you see here is that I have what I've, I, I really need to write another blog post on it because I'm such a big fan of the hyper key. And what the hyper key is um, basically you'll notice here that it's the, it's control option shift command all pressed simultaneously, which you would never basically be able to do like normally, no human would ever try to press all four keys simultaneously and something else. And so I bind all four of those uh, modifier keys to the caps lock because I basically never use the caps lock. If I need all caps, I'll literally just hold down the shift key. I'm fine. So I've remapped the caps lock key to a hyper key. And what that allows me to do then is that when I hit caps lock C, it switches me to Chrome. Caps lock V, VS code. Caps lock S, because I use Obsidian so much. Caps lock O technically would be the more like normal one you would think of, but I because I there's a huge advantage to having one hand basically be able to do all my workflows, then a command S is like for second brain, or I think of it as scribing writing. So that's how I switch between that. And that's how I'm basically swapping between things is with basically a single key press. And it's so easy to do because your pinky just rests directly on the caps lock and it just does everything from there. So anyways, so for whatever reason, I'm running into caching issues, but that's not the point. The point is I wanna show you, I wanna show you this Nuxt image stuff. Okay, so in this retrospective, we've talked about it. this image here is ginormous, like way too big. Like it's irresponsible for me to be shipping um, something that's 2048 pixels for a render size of 676. All right, so what am I gonna do to fix this? We are gonna go inside of, we're gonna go inside of the blog post. So I think it was what, 2020 retrospective? Great, all right. And so in here I have an image. What I'm gonna do is rather than use the markdown syntax, I'm going to use this new global component that's exposed by Nuxt image called Nuxt image. <laughs> and what I'm gonna do is here's the alt text, so I don't wanna lose that. But more importantly, I want the uh, source to be this image. And the source, let's clarify where the source is. Actually, I'm gonna show you this real quick. The source of the image lives in the static directory right here. And the reason I like this a lot, by the way, is because normally we're used to managing our images inside of an assets folder because Webpack, usually you're running it through some sort of optimization. The reason we put all our images in static is because we're saying, we're gonna hand over optimization to Nuxt image. Like it'll do its own thing, its own build pipeline to make sure everything works so that we don't have to be responsible for doing all the asset transformation and hooking up all the Webpack things, which to me, I'll be totally honest, the farther you can get me from Webpack, the better. So let's go ahead and make sure everything's still working. So using this next image tag. When I save, I'm gonna switch back over to Chrome. You're gonna notice that everything disappears. And the reason for this is because this is, I think, a limitation, all of the like view, D, view MDX, like all this sort of markdown syntax that allows you to include components from other frameworks. This self-closing tag right here is basically a no-go because you don't have a compiler to go ahead and figure out what that is. So what you need to do is actually do a proper closing tag and not the self-closing one. And when you do that and save, you'll see that the rest of my stuff shows up. Now, of course, we're looking at this image and you're probably thinking like, all right, Ben, this is still the same thing. It's still intrinsically 2048. 
and it's still being rendered. But you'll notice something already a little bit different is that this source is actually being rendered from the underscore IPX directory. And IPX is basically like Nux's own or like one of their brand, like tools, tool chains that helps you do all the image optimization. So already you can see something's happening. And so let's just say, for example, let me go into here. We want to go ahead and ensure that on basically on large device sizes, it's no bigger than, let's say, 500 pixels. I'm just give it a hard value. The way we would do that is, believe it or not, we add a prop to our image that we say that on large devices, we pass it a value of 500 pixels. And I'm just going to save. And what that'll do, one, you already notice something's already changed, which is you'll notice that the rendered size is actually now 500 pixels. And for those watching, if you're following, this is amazing because this means that Nux image has taken the original image and brought it down to the size I want at the device size I want. So to prove my point, I'm going to go further. I'm going to say at the medium device size, I want it to be half, let's say let's just shrink it by a third. And then at small device sizes, I'm going to go down and do 150 pixels. All right. And to show you why this is really cool, shrink, 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 jump down. And you'll see, by the way, that this image has all of that source set. I'm not going to say nonsense. It's just all that API stuff you'd have to learn and populate yourself to be like, at 150 width, do this source set and all that stuff. It's done for you. Look at this. This image here, 300 pixels. Shrink it even further. Oh my gosh, check this out. Now, this thing that we have here is now, what is it? It's probably like... 150 and this is the size this is what and so hold on to show you why this is even cooler you're like is it faking it is it whatnot all right here we go ready i'm going to go ahead and run a build on our current and show you what's actually being like generated and so this might take a second to do 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 yeah i'm going to be doing a whole new css system so for those looking at the tailwind i definitely have over time really like it, it was fun experimenting and and trying it out but i do think I, i'm probably better at my own on that okay next generate oh wait yarn generate that's what i should have run generate not build once we're gen hey what's up jacob all right i i really have to update the dependencies in my blog it has it needs a lot of tlc for this stuff but it's okay we are we're getting there are we okay building up oh, okay i think we're going to get out of disk directory. Boom. OK, here you go. Inside the disk, disk directory, look inside of our public image. You're going to see that we have our dino stuff here. But hold up. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Blog 2020 retrospective index. Where's my image? Not that one. Here we go. So inside of this Nux directory, you'll see now that it actually built out, okay, this time they're currently being hashed. So you'll see here that we have the Nux image slash 85835, 8357. Anyways, what I'm trying to show you here is that it's actually built out for you, although I'm a little confused at the moment because it should underscore Nux image JPEG. There must be something I'm missing. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, here we go. Ha! I went to the wrong image. Okay, here we go. These are my images at the different... <laughs> Thank you, Mazadeep. Ooh, Jacob's officially downloading Obsidian. Yes. Join the Obsidian team. It's honestly, I, I do really enjoy the software that's being built. Look, our images are generated for us. And the reason I think this is so exciting is because... This, I'm all about lowering the barrier of entry when it comes to this kind of stuff, <laughs> Alex, with the not a cult. And so by releasing Nux module, I really think this is basically the tipping point in my mind for getting developers to really actually own the full development lifecycle of their blog without having to reach out to learn something different. The fact that in my blog posts, as I'm writing Markdown, it's really not all that different if you look at it from a syntax perspective, because what we're saying here is that you write your image source like you normally would. You write your alt text like you normally would. The only real thing difference here is you have this sizes thing that allows you to define it how you want it to look at different points. And so if you're wondering, though, like, I don't want to define a hard width, 
that's totally fine. So in this particular case, I can also do things like other CSS units, like view width, viewport width. So in this regard, I could be like, okay, 100 viewport width, small viewport width. And so what this does then, when I save and we open up the dev, the bum bum bum. All right, here we go. And it's building. All right, great. So here, you'll notice now that our image now actually does what I wanted to do, which is actually hit the full width. But the nice thing about it here is you'll notice that right now it's actually size of the device. So here it's 462. But then when I jump it up larger, we'll see here that it's jumped now to 676. And now, however, though, you'll notice it's interesting. The intrinsic size, though, is larger. And that makes sense, actually, because the device size for large, which I'll show how that actually is configured in a sec, is large device corresponds to 1024. So as a result, that makes sense. It automatically generates the 1024 image. And then when it jumps the breakpoint, it will do the next one. So with that, yes. OK, Mazadeep, I got you. Don't worry. I'm going to go ahead and actually commit this right now. Let's go ahead and move this over. And I'm just going to say uh, feature next image to build pipeline. All right, then I got to figure out this is probably going to bother me. So we're going to take I really should not. How do I I need to figure out how to get remove file from history because I guess I accidentally committed that thing. Get remove cache thing. OK, that's what it is. I always forget this thing. Is there where's the SW file components content hide dist hide static. I guess I'll wait for it to show up again. OK. So let's talk about configuring sizes because this is imp so next image has obviously optimized a bunch of stuff for us. This is great. But here's the real question is how do we configure things? Well, inside of our let me bump this up a bit. So I'll drop this in the chat. TV Ben code Zen. Oh, I'm an in incognito. I'm wondering who's still there we go. Oh, I need to log on to the correct not incognito. Give me a sec. This is a downside to the single device setup that I have right now. But on the upside, what's really great is that this MacBook Air is cruising. Like I have not noticed any performance delay on this, which blows my mind that a MacBook Air is outperforming my MacBook Pro i9, 64 gigabytes of RAM, like tricked out. It's making me just so sad. And I will continue to be astounded by its battery life and everything. So much love for this device. And very clear, I have no affiliate program that this M1 MacBook Air is kicking its butt. Now, don't get me wrong. We still need to test this with the DSLR camera hooked up to it. Part of the problem is I, I am limited on ports. So I'm going to have to figure out what I want to do for extending that. But And I've heard that the MacBook Air might not be able to support a lot of multiple monitors. So we'll see how I want to deal with that going forward. I have debated getting the, the new iMac as a way of getting around this. But in the meantime, I'm taking your endorsement on that. Honestly, Charlie, the, I don't think, I think every developer who actually picked up a MacBook Air, I, I, I feel like has, and has been just blown away by its battery life performance and ability to, especially now that the M chip has been around for a little while. A lot of software now properly supports it. Whereas I would say I was a fairly early adopter and some things like even NVM were acting up a little bit because it wasn't technically like the um, Intel processor. And so there were weird things that C was crashing into and that kind of stuff. But anyways, enough about my love about MacBook Air. I'm sure it'll come up later, but I'm just so happy it's working. Okay, whatever, error, error, error. What I wanted to show you all here is the fact that we can actually define the different screens. And so these are actually what's being defined by default. You see that these are all basically your standard screen sizes, 320, 640, 768, 1024, 1280. Uh, 1536 is interesting to me. I thought it was something different, but cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to detract for a quick second on this. The Jacob has saying was waiting for the new 16 inch MacBook Pro. I will tell you right now, I was waiting for the exact same thing. I thought they were going to announce it at WWDC. And honestly, I, I am actually, I'm one, I'm disappointed they didn't release it, but it's fine. I think it's a matter. But in the meantime, the MacBook Air seriously has been a big upgrade on my productivity. 
And if you're wondering if you're debating between the Air and the Pro from what all the reviews I've seen, basically the main difference is the Pro does come with a slightly longer battery life. And I don't mean slightly, it goes from 20 hours to like 21 or 22 hours. It is heavier. But the other problem, which I, which is the reason I did not get the Pro, is because it actually has a touch bar, and you cannot get it with the function, like the F function keys. And so the fact that the MacBook Air gives me the function keys as like keys I can hit, and I have fingerprint recognition, and it's lighter, and I, I, I've done stuff like video export and stuff on here, and it still continues to perform at the level that I, I want it to. I'm actually really happy with the Air selection because. At least for me, I know this is bonkers for a lot of people. I'm going to have the Air. I will I will keep the Air because I love the Air. But then when they come out with the Pro like 16 or 14 inch with the M chip, I'll make a decision to get that as well because I'm going to want to, I'm curious to see the performance differences in the, hopefully the M2 chip at that. Mazadeeb was talking about, oh, apparently M1s might have trouble with VMs and the likes. I haven't actually dealt with VMs and Docker. So that's a fair point. If you're dealing a lot with virtual image, like virtual machines, maybe the M chips aren't the best for that. But as far as running node servers, like your local Yarn, Yarn Dev, again, I've done screen recording, done video exporting, even done like Blender, so 3D animation, all that stuff, it has worked really well. Yeah, Jacob, I'm glad I could help with that. And, and the other thing that I think a lot of people don't know is Apple has a very generous return policy. Like, I believe if you return the machine within 30 days, as long as you didn't demolish it, I'm pretty sure they actually accept it. Uh, so something to keep in mind. As far as should I even try it? Because I, again, I, I vaguely remember the return policy is really quite generous. Okay. <laughs> I said I was going to stop gushing. But again, if you all have more questions about the M1s, I'm more than happy to, ju to jump on that. But so back to the next image piece. This is really cool, I think, that one, they give you this API that makes it easy to modify. So where this would go, let me show you real quick. If I go inside the next config, Basically, like most frameworks here, we have a bunch of stuff we can configure. And so things like the comp like components property here, I could basically in here, I'm just going to copy this real quick because you basically have an image property that you're going to be looking at. And inside of here, it will receive a config object. So if we wanted to add a custom screen size, we would basically add like screens and call it like Twitch size. Although it's a JSON. No, this should work. Twitch size and Twitch size is whatever, 1440 pixels or 1440. And now that would give us access to this new size, screen size when we're accessing it. But to me, actually, what's really interesting is that the developer experience, the next team is just phenomenal at this, is that it goes beyond this. So let me just save this because this is fine as an empty object. What it allows you to do here is that you can actually set presets on your images, meaning that rather than be like, oh, I have to like manually define this every single time, we can basically provide a next image preset on the source, and that will take care of it even further from that. So you can imagine if, let's say, for let's say I'm going to say that every single blog image will be a preset of a certain thing with a specific format, and that I didn't even talk about that. You can actually choose the format that it optimizes and outputs it in. It's amazing. Let's do this because actually this is interesting to me. So what if I gave a preset, and I'm going to add the what is it modify? Oh, which okay, here we go. So I'm going to call it a blog and the modifiers that it'll take are, we're going to switch over. So format with height, I'll remember that. Format is we're going to make sure that it's JPEG. Width, we're going to make sure that it's 100 viewport width. And that's actually, you know what, let's just make sure we, sh we show that it works. 50 viewport width, let's just save that. So if I save that here and then start up the dev server now, this should take in the new configurations. Okay. All right, so let me go ahead and open up. Where's my incognito window? I think it's, is it this one? All right, we'll find out if it's still broken. The blog. Okay, everything's working again. Yay, we don't need incognito. Okay, so here we have our image working exactly as it was previously, where it's 100 viewport width. But let me go ahead and maximize this so we can actually do like a slide transition to make it easier on people so it's less blinky. When we go inside now, I'm going to go inside and open up my retrospective. And this time, rather than defining the sizes manually like this, which is fine, it's nice to know that it's even at that, even that is considered low level API because we're about to get into some pretty interesting stuff. If I do a preset of blog and we save, let's jump back over and refresh. 
did this work? Nope, I don't think it did. Format. Let me double check the docs on this real quick. Uh, let me close this. Let me bump this up. Format height. Maybe it doesn't take CSS values. Maybe I was a little bold in that. Let me just make sure it even works to begin with. So let's let's do 250. And I'm just going to do a height of 100. Let's just like be... Let's follow the docs as close to po as, as humanly possible before I try to go outside the... Too outside of it. And end up breaking it. Let's see. So Charlie was saying... Oh, Thesis is saying that... Thesis has the M1 Pro, no problems with Docker so far. That is great, excellent. And then Charlie saying need to go to Discord server going for these kind of discussions. <laughs> I have I have debated setting up a Discord server, but in the meantime, if there's a Discord server I can totally recommend, actually you should totally check out Cassidy's Patreon because if you join us one of her Patreon, she has... All right, I think it's here, Patreon. Boom. Her, her, her Discord server is amazing. I've had the, the honor of being able to just be in there and for some of the discussions. If you're looking for a lot of similar minded people, I will say I have a lot of fun in her Discord server. So in the meantime, while I'm figuring out whether or not I end up setting one for myself, definitely uh, check hers out. She's really great. All right, back to this. Oh yes, it worked. Ha. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. Look at this. It actually cut it the way I wanted it to. And you know why this is exciting is because this means that now we can actually do things like blog post covers. We can, we basically now get to optimize our writing workflow to just, we drop the original image and then it takes care of it. It's t it takes care of it from there. And that is super exciting to me. And so presets are super great. Some of this other stuff don't worry about, but actually this is something I do want to change though. So something we noticed earlier that I'm a big believer in, and this has this is completely framework agnostic. So I don't, I basically don't care what framework it is when it comes to this. We were talking about the build output earlier for the images, and you'll see here that we have this like hash that's being generated, and so for the people, for for those of us that work with CSS modules, and actually I'm just gonna do a quick primer on it because I think it's worth the time on this. So CSS modules, if you hadn't heard of it already, it basically says, there we go, okay. So what it basically says is that we're gonna take your red class, right? That's color red. Actually, I'm not gonna do red. I'm gonna do button because everyone knows the, the infamous button class. Border, radius, five pixels, border, color, blue, whatever. Okay, CSS, so the problem with what we know that CSS scoping becomes a tricky part, right? When you add the module, when you use CSS modules, again, this is how Vue happens to do it, but again, every I think every framework has their way of doing this. At the end of the day, what's injected into your website is a customizable hash. So usually what ends up happening is it looks something like this. It's valid, it's a valid CSS class, but it's also unintelligible. And the reason I I'll just use the word. The reason I despise hash only generated things is because it makes it incredibly difficult to debug later on. And there's absolutely no reason why we need to go this extreme when it comes to randomization. So I'm a believer in this case, for example, with CSS modules, if you're using it, you really should be prefacing your hash with like basically the, the original class. Because at the bare minimum, this tells you that the original class was this. I can at least search the code base for dot button. But I'm gonna do you one better. I actually think for an optimal developer experience, it should go one step further. Because unless, unless your CSS is really impacting your payload this much, I think this extra bit of text is even better, which is, I think you should actually append the component that the CSS is coming from. Because now you have an even clear, you're just, I think that this will honestly save more time because I know that sometimes people get obsessed with saving bytes. This is not one of those cases because I, when things are broken, you really don't want to be wasting developer time on figuring out where things are. Let's let's build cooler features and actually fix the bug. And hence, to me, this is really like the the the, the coup de gras of image or sorry not image of like hash generation providing context. David Trump. Okay, so hold on, I missed something. Alex is saying, if you like Obsidian, Taco Bell, and spicy takes, yes, Cassidy's Discord is the one for you. Also, if you say Obsidian three times, Ben shows up. Yes, this this may or may not be true. I guess you'll have to you have to try it and 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 see for yourself. Okay, so 
this this to me is actually call it like the optimum developer experience because it, it just gets you to what you need. That borrowing from that principle, I really should write a blog post on that. I, I you know what? Hold on, we're gonna do the, the obsidian thing right now. And say why I call it my beliefs <laughs> on hash generation for CSS modules. Oh my gosh, we have a mention here of Dota 2. Oh man, I've been playing a lot of Fortnite, by the way. <laughs> for those who don't know, Fortnite has been my game of relaxation, believe it or not. Uh, a lot of things to talk about with that. But I, do, I did have my Dota days, a league. Oh gosh, memories. Okay, so then again, true to my true to my Obsidian ways, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure. So this is content I want to write at some point. Really, is gonna end up probably being a blog post at some point, and I'm probably I don't know where I'm gonna publish it yet, but this will go in the queue, and I think that's good enough. Yep, just those tags will throw it into my content box, and to show you how that works. My content dashboard is here. Oh wait, is this content muse? Oh wait, I didn't, I did not rename this yet. Where is it being? Yep. So here are my, here's my queue. So then my beliefs on hash generation for CSS modules. See, it's not beautiful yet, but it's working. Okay. I took my note. It's, it's, it's put into some people are talking about gaming. I love it. Apex Legends. I've heard a lot of things about Apex Legends. Heard good things about it. Jacob saying the fire in Fortnite is so cathartic. Yes. <laughs> For those who um, follow um, our old boss, Sarah Drasner, she is a master of fire. And just we had a lot of fun with the fire bows uh, back in season six. And oh, fun fact. We were talking about developer like delight and like little Easter eggs. In Fortnite, there is a costume, which is a, a corn cob. So you basically run around as a corn. And we learned that when the corn cob is set on fire and takes fire damage, it actually pops popcorn. Like, that's amazing. I love that attention to detail to these kind of things and just little things like that. To me, I was like, really what makes user experience just an absolute delight. Okay, so I've added my notes on that. Okay, so <laughs> I had my opinions about image, uh, not image hashes in general. And so inside of the disk folder, you'll you'll notice that all our images are well, they're they're hashes, which is exactly what I don't want. <laughs> because what this means is it's useless that if for whatever reason you're debugging your like index.html, let me just like re can I reformat it real quick? Great. You'll see here that the source is this like nux image hash. Here's the alt, which is fine. That that would help me when it comes to debuggability. And technically, yes, there's a hash here and a hash. But I'd, I'd really like to know what the original image is because this is, that would be a lot of work. And so, though it's not configured by default, the Nux team already thought of this, thank goodness, because I asked them about this. And there's this configuration option for what the static file name will actually be outputted to. So if I go ahead and copy this over, uh, and I'm going to go ahead now and jump into my don't save this because that's wrong. Nux config will go down to the image property. I'm going to add a set the static file name here. And so now when I'm going to run my, oh, I'm going to stop this now. We're going to yarn, woo, kill, 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 yarn, generate, go. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. So Mazadeep is saying here, I think React.js uses this class name generation strategy and development. I think that's great. And I, and I know that, again, the argument for shipping production with the smallest bytes possible is getting rid of CSS class names, but I find it hard to believe that most like people's, when it comes to slowing down what you're delivering to users, if it, I gotta say, you must have fine tuned your app to a point, like an ex like the actual impact on rendering time, I would, I question whether it makes that much of a difference. That like you probably could not be spending more time on, for example, image optimization, on actually making sure your code is bundled correctly because JavaScript and there's so many other things I feel like people could be fine tuning, but a lot of times we get caught up in these sort of like optimizations of things like, oh, we could like save a few kilobytes, but if that's not blocking your rendering time, it's really a pointless optimization. So I would, I, I still, in my personal opinion, I would argue it's worth shipping that in production because isn't that where the bugs ultimately are typically? I would say like when a user says something is broken, you want to actually look and be able to sh like, you want to ask a user to go, hey, open the inspector, check this out. I think there's, I, I, I would argue there's value in that. 
that said, I'm sure there are some discussions to be had and always there are nuances and exceptions, but it's just a principle of mind to make debugging for developers as easy as humanly possible. Okay, so now that everything's built, let's check this out. So here we're inside our Nux con, let me go ahead and actually widen this a little bit. Okay, so inside of our disk, Nux image. Oh, this makes sense, I forgot. It, it still illustrates the point. Because my, I forgot in the readme, I'd only gave it a, a single preset, it only generated one image. But you'll notice now, it did exactly what we want, which is it appended the original image name with a hash, which is perfect. This is so good. And I'm just so excited about this because now let me go back. I'm going to, what I do want to figure out, actually, I realize though, let me see, where's my, oh, no, no, no. I want a 2020 retrospective, 2020 retrospective. All right. So rather than, this is something I do want to figure out though, because I would like to say the preset blog is always going to be this certain thing. I don't want to have to define the multiple sizes every time. So let's try to debug this together real quick. So inside of Nux config, I had said that the blog should always output JPEG, but here's the thing. It doesn't take responsive sizes. I would hold on. Let me look at the, the thing real quick because let's see, we have the source, we have the width, the height, the sizes. I'd love to make that a preset preset cover. Oh, I don't think the cover, you know what? I'm just going to call it. I don't think the cover takes the CSS. Uh, oh, look, interesting though. You can actually define the fit, the modifier. So I imagine that's like you could maybe even position what's actually being outputted or output. I think that's, is it output or outputted? I don't know what's the past sense of that. I'm gonna say the output. Format, quality, yep, you can define the quality here. Cover, contain, fill, inside, outside. Modifiers with, I think these modifier. Oh, what? No. Hold on, I just just got, look, look at this. Hang on, look. Round corner, zero of a hundred. What is this? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Round corner might be a cloud nerdy thing. Hold on, I'm not gonna play with that just yet. So there's a question inside of the chat. Does the Nux scaffolder support Tailwind JIT? Why is JIT not ring a bell? I know what Tailwind is, just in time mode. Oh, that is a good, this looks, actually, this looks new. Hold on, Nux Tailwind. I It might support it. They're usually, Nux and Tailwind are usually pretty good. Yeah, helps you set up Nux Tailwind CSS too. Yep, supports Tailwind just in time. Yep, yep. There you go. So let me drop this in the chat. Whoop, that's not what I want at all. Go back. All right, so here. Wow, why can't I copy correctly? All right, we're gonna jump inside of Twitch real quick and drop the link. So yes, Tailwind just in time is supported. Whoa, my face is so big. Hold on. Okay, this is a better distance. <laughs> I need to get used to this. Okay, boom. All right, Tailwind is supported there. Oh, this is, I wonder, this would be cool if we could play with stuff like this, but I, I see that the, per okay, oh, sorry. Let me, this is worth clarifying. So I am, I'm obviously very excited because I really love it when developers have a chance to own the tooling, but without a ton of configuration. And so, what I've showed you here is like the native Nux provider as far as it can build the stuff on its own. So basically if you deploy to Netlify, it will automatically build and deploy your images as basically as you would expect. However, it is worth noting that there are a bunch of other ones. So if you're using like Cloudinary, for example, like you can actually configure it to coordinate with Cloudinary to do those things. I'm sure at some point I'll build like a demo or so on that, but like right now my big interest is allowing developers to get up and running with as little integrations as possible. Because I know, especially with things like Cloudinary, the truth is a lot of, especially indie devs, especially when we're first getting started, like pricing can be tricky, right? And sometimes you're afraid of hit hitting limits, accidentally going over billing rates. And guess what? With the with what Nuxt offers you with the IPX out of the box, you don't need that. It does all that for you. And then, and then when you ever you need to scale to something like Cloudinary, then you can actually do so intentionally. But in the meantime, you get to learn how to use technology like this. And I think that's, I think that's really exciting. Okay, so let me switch over here. All right, so this is a little sad because at least let me try one more time. I don't think this worked though. Because I believe width and height actually need to be like a proper thing. This is, oh, you know what? Even more reason why this probably doesn't work. Although, let me see if the docs say anything more about preset sizes. It's just, I really wish sizes could be put into, yeah, because sizes is here, which is nice, but I'd like to, 
abstract that one more time, it looks like that is not possible at this time. So we're going to do, we're, we're developers. We can do this. All right, so let me, let me delete the preset right now. I don't need presets right now. But what I can do is inside of global, I'm going to write, I'm going to create a blog image component. And this blog image component is going to be very, very simple. We're going to take, uh, we're going to actually, let's take this. Let's take this over here. We'll take this next image. And we're just going to, this is going to be our template. Oh, that's all we're doing. We're dropping the image. But we're going to take a prop of source and it's going to be a type of string and it's going to be required. And then this way we will bind the source to the source prop. And then I probably could do this slightly differently, but I'm just being explicit right now because I, I feel like we could do like an a attribute fall through thing, but I really, I do like the um, explicitness of this. And then ignore preset. And then in here, we're gonna define our sizes. So we're gonna say all blog images are gonna have large, gonna be 100 viewport width, uh, medium, 100 viewport width, and small, 100 viewport width. I'm not even gonna optimize for the extra small. I think that might be a little much. I'm gonna make this assumption here. So that's that. So if this works as I expect, so one, let's make sure it's broken. And by broken, let's make sure that it doesn't show up on the page at all again. So sorry, I killed my server. So let me go ahead and hide the right sidebar so y'all can see a little bit bigger. And then we are generating. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so now we're up and running. So I'm going to refresh and great. Our image is gone. This is expected. Okay, so now we're going to test this out. We're going to drop in. We're not going to, okay, so we're going to, I'm uh, sorry, I'm copying this back in so that I don't. So we're going to do a uh, blog. I think I called that blog image. Blog image, yes. Okay. So blog image, blog image, fingers crossed. Hold on to your butts, let's do this. Save. It's refreshed. Oh, did it work, did it work, did it work? The fastest <laughs> image is no image. Well said thesis, well said. But check it out. There it is, 1024, drop down. This is it. Drop, oh wait, it's not small enough. Oh wait, did it not, here we go. Wait a second, refresh. Oh, is it because of the device size is not? Okay, it does have it though, 640 here, 640. Okay, that should be fine. I think this worked. We're gonna go ahead and verify that though, because I'm a little skeptical. All right, let me do this, let me do this. Okay, I did a refactor, use new blog image component. And then while we're at it, I see that SW, SW file we're not supposed to be committing. So we had, again, another thing I really love about Alfred clipboard history. I had something about git rm cached, great. And then that will now hopefully get rid of this. All right, so then that, so this is a, I guess a chore, remove SW from history. Great. All right. So if I yarn generate now, I should, if it's working correctly, I should get three images of the dino suit. So I should get three viewconf us 2020 dino.jpegs. Fingers crossed. Because if this works, this means that now we've basically created our own preset, which is, oh, I see it. I see it. Next. Nuxt, nuxt, oh, sorry, not nuxt, dist. We want dist. Dist, dist, nuxt, images, boom, boom. Oh, wait a second, weird. This is a bug, I think. I think we found a bug. Because if I reveal it in the finder, oh, no, this is interesting. They are 768. Okay, this one should be a little smaller, 640. Oh, it is the right size. That's interesting. I would have 1024. Yeah, these are the three sizes we wanted. 
Okay, so it is working. Not a bug. The only weird bug is I expected... I expected VS Code to render them like boink, boink, boink. Okay, fine. I, I, this is, this is why we check <laughs> before we make accusations. It's working. Okay, great. So you know what this means? This means now I can literally go through the rest of my blog posts and look for like inclusions here. So like here, Iron Man 2 scene, this is something I had done. So I can now do blog image. I can do the alt text, which is this. I can grab the source here. And, oh, sorry, not self-enclosed. I can't self-enclose, that's the only thing. Now I'm gonna save that. What else is there? There's another graph here. Let's do that. Blog image alt, great. I probably could do some sort of search and, search and replace on this, but this is part of it. I think, like for example, I avoided images actually as much as I could in my blog because I did have that guilt about shipping large images on my site. And I wanted to, even though I had not spent time fine tuning performance, I wanted to at least be somewhat respectful of that. But with this, haha, game has changed. All right, this is good in Iron Man 3 scene. I think this is the last one where it's slash images. Okay, almost a couple more. Let's just do this real quick. Alt, boom, done. Source, although I'm starting to sense a pattern where I could actually theoretically do it, but I think it might be too late for me to optimize for it. Ba -bum 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 -bum. Yeah, and I'm also not good at, yeah, I'm just not comfortable with regex. So I know that basically, so for example, I could look for like the markdown tag, and then I would need to check to make sure that it's actually a slash image relative URL, because otherwise I'm actually doing a, a remote URL. And I think you can actually transform remote stuff too, but that is a topic for another day. So here's the source here, great. And then we could always do that there, that's wrong. All right, save, magic. Ba -bum -bum -bum. Interesting, yeah, I need to, I need to, I, I will wanna optimize all this stuff later. Okay, so if all went well, the reason I wanted to test out this, oh, that's not what I wanted. Close, 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 close. Oh no, how do I close all these windows? Kill terminal? Okay, I don't know. Oh, there's no key binding for it. That's why. All right, yarn, generate. Whoop, that, that was wrong. All right. We saw here is that even with just fairly minimum image replacements, oh my lord, check it. Oh, I did it again. Dang it. Okay, okay, okay. Let's look at this. Look, look, this, Nux. Look at all these images. It optimized for us. Oh man, this is so great. And so now, so check, okay, so I'm gonna just, so again, all we did was we just swapped out like the markdown image for regular HTML. Oh, that's just some auto formatting, I don't care. Okay, so this is a refactor, swap out for next image. Oh, this is, oh, I'm so excited. It's gonna give me like, I have a whole new like inspiration now for working on my site because now anywhere on my site, since it's built on Nux, I can just add in the image thing and do avatars and I can add a full size resolution thing. Granted, I'll try to like, don't get me wrong, for, those, de for developers who are new, let me cautionary tale. <laughs> if you have something that's 5,000 pixels and it's like huge, got beautiful resolution, and then you just try to cram it down into 500, I would say unless you, Unless it's, so basically, usually you just lose a ton of resolution and it can be really tricky for certain things and so it can get super pixelated. And so certainly, so you do have to be somewhat intelligent about how you use this. So for things where that crisp, crisp detail matters, then yes, you certainly do want to try to get the original photo as close to the size as you intend them to. But for otherwise, for things where you just, they're like background images and you don't, like pixelation is not really as much of a concern. Like you can go to town with this, which is so great. And so now we'll see if I open up my Netlify dashboard, uh, there should be a deployment running. Did I not link it? Oh, let me link. Link the site to a repo. Yes, it is linked. Bum, 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 bum. Let's see, okay. So in the chat, Mazadeep saying, I've seen this interesting SVG outline, like things show up before the image loads up on Kenzie's image. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so I know SVG optimization is a tricky one because for example, I, I can even show you this. Uh, yeah, this is totally fine. So one of the things I, I got recently, so I commissioned this little dragon avatar. So let me, let me give the shout out though, because if you're looking for this kind of work, she's 
awesome. Kelly Mahoney. So she she does the So Splush. So some of you might recognize some of her work. She's known for some of her like framework stickers as well as other things. I just, I really love her stuff. So I just want to support. So she has these really cute dev stickers, like this is fine. How do y'all ML, for example, shout out to her. I'm just gonna drop her link. I get, I get, by the way, very clear. I get, this is not a, um, I don't get any like kickbacks or anything. This is really love her work. I did, I got, I did a commission with her. So she can use character commissions here. And so we can see here that there's this like awesome SVG with sort of the blue dragon logo that I have with the obsidian logo and view, no surprise. But for example, I noticed though, like when we resize, if I try to keep the ratio in, the lines start getting thicker. Like you'll notice that like the, the black and by thicker, it looks like the black lines aren't resizing. And it's because to be honest, SVGs are a, a tricky thing. Like certain things need to be flattened, things need to be like relative, etc. So that's why, for example, just be careful with this kind of resize. Use the scale tool. Hold up. What is thesis referring to? I have this frame here in Figma. I could, you're saying I should flatten it, flatten everything. That did. If you're saying, like, I, I've done the thing where, like, I'm trying to, like, K hotkey. I'm using the K. That's not it. Press K and resize. Okay. So I'm going to hit K. I don't see anything change. Oh, wait. Is it from here? So from here, hit K. Okay. Now resize. All right, try again. Oh my Lord. <laughs> that was it. All right, thesis with the save. All right, here we go. We learned something new today. <laughs> Reese, what would you call it? The scale tool learned about. So here, I discovered the scale tool in Figma. Oop, that was wrong. Figma thanks to thesis. And thank you, Jimena, for the assist. Oh man, that's great. Cause I, <laughs> I was I was like super faking it with this giant artboard. And now I can. Oh, this is great. Oh, so interesting. So I guess like when I was resizing it, it was like doing it a different way. See? Things you learn about. But yeah, so anyways, another reason why I love SVG is that like it retains its crispness over time. But uh, anyhow, image optimization. Tricky topic. But I just okay. Oh, here we go. Is it Deployed, NTL open, bum, bum, bum. Oh no, it, oh wait, branch failed. Uh-oh, I think it did not work. This is, yeah, swapped it out, something broke. Oh no, is it the, oh wait, failed during yarn install, weird, let's just, Clear clash and deploy site. I have a lot of old dependencies. Hey, what's up, Wallolo? Is it Wallolo? Wallolo. <laughs> I like it. I like saying it. Yeah, Nux, Nux is definitely at this point my sort of fr uh, meta framework of choice when it comes to Vue. But it's totally worth mentioning that for those who love like the graph QL Gatsby syntax, Gridsum is also an option for you as well. So they basically, it's very, basically very similar to Gatsby. So the, the knowledge transfer should be fairly straightforward. And, and then other static site generators to definitely keep in mind. VPress is really kind of the, the hot one to really keep a watch of. The team, the team is actually working a bit on working on getting it to like V1. And right now there's, we're actually working on theming for it. There's a lot of great stuff that's happening. And so I, I should probably do a whole episode on Vite and VPress and all that fun stuff. Yeah, Alex, I apparently broke prod and I'm really sad. Oh, you know what? What if it's because I'm in the wrong, what node environment is this in? Ah, it's in version 12. No, 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 no. Don't deploy in version 12. Ba -bum -bum -bum. In node version. Oh yeah, I froze it at 12 at one point. I totally forgot I did that. That would explain why everything's breaking. Save. All right, now let's refresh deploys. Clear cache. All right, so let's see. Oh, Age of Empires freeze. Oh my gosh, that is, <laughs> that is a throwback right there. Oh man, Age of Empires. I Speaking of Age of Empire type games, um, for those who don't know, Civilization VI, I've learned has a really, like talk about like cult audiences. I do know Civ has a really big audience as for like, really loyal fans and recently got introduced to that by Cassidy and gosh, that 
the learning curve for that game is it feels intense. Like if people told me that Dota was a large learning curve, but maybe because I had prior experience, it wasn't as bad. But woo, Civ Six thesis next stream Age of Empires with Ben. Honestly, is that thing even? Is there even I? I honestly, I thought about streaming gaming. I would have a lot of fun doing that. Not gonna lie. Age of Empires Four. Oh man. You mean Cassidy's productivity tool? Yes, him and a Cassidy's productivity tool. <laughs> That's what we tell ourselves. Honestly, yeah, I've debated streaming gaming as like part of the channel as like kind of like a fun thing to do. They have the HD one on Steam. I mean, when you get RWC peeps to play AOE, wait, what? Hold up. <laughs> Cassie and I should do a co Civ stream. I would tell you, I am terrible at Civ 6 right now. Like, I basically, I know the basics as far as like moving troops and stuff, but I feel like I don't know what I'm doing half <laughs> the time. But Jimena saying that Age of Empires, oh man, I would actually, like, I would play it as a noob and like just stream it. That that sounds like a lot of fun. So Jimena, let's let's figure something out. But yes, this would probably be a long stream. That's probably why a lot of people like streaming stuff like Fortnite. It is nice and, and fairly quick. Oh, look, I think it's it's live. Bum bum bum. Go over to the blog. Check out the image. Boom boom boom. Yes. It did it. It did it. Something's a little funny though. Why does it say the intrinsic size is this? File size is this. File size is this. Nope, that looks weird. My suspicion is right. Something is funky. But at least we're getting closer. That's weird though. This image revealing sources panel. Oh, I wonder, oh, you know what? What if it's because dino, there's only one dino in here. That doesn't make sense. Underscore Nux images, VPOG, bread, logo, search in all files. Now I'm a little thrown off. Let me delete this dist folder. Hold up. That looks a little sus. I'm not going to lie. Cassidy, yes, it'll be 10 hours. It can be an all-day marathon, Cassidy. We'll be, we'll be very productive. Yep. All these images should be generated. Why did it not show up in my build? Is that not how it works? Oh, it's the page. Oh, okay. I was panicking for no reason. Okay, that, that makes sense. Because it's only going to... Duh, it's not the entire... Um, it's not going to be the entire... Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh, okay. I'm feeling better now. Yay, yay, yay me not having opened the dev tools in this section for a little while. So the confusion was at one point is that why... Okay, so let me, let me, let's refresh this page again. So why, when we go ahead and look at this image, why the heck is it saying that it has an intrinsic size of 1024? After all, you're probably thinking like, okay, 1024 makes sense because I'm on a large device. I haven't hit a break point yet. But then if you're looking at the source sets of the other ones, funny enough, they actually still say 1024. I and mean, that's because they haven't actually loaded yet, which seems to me like it represents it slightly inaccurately to me because these are supposed to be like basically different sizes. Cause you'll see that once I shrink it a little bit more Oy. inside of the, if I, if, if we actually go into the sources panel, we'll actually see the image. So here, this image, can I hover over it? I had it a second ago. How did I do this here? It, it like generated multiple ones. Of course, now that I'm trying to duplicate it, it's not showing up. Ba -bum -bum -bum. Refresh and then Open up images. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. No. Oh, y'all saw it earlier, right? I, I am not. Okay, here we go. Now there's multiple sizes. Jeez. Okay, so again, this is why like low level APIs, I think it's great to understand how some technology works, but it can be such a rabbit hole to understand how to do these things that like it gets in the way of the important thing, which is for example, writing your blog post and just publishing it. And for this reason, I am very grateful that someone else is dealing with how to optimize these things. Yep. Jacob is asking, 
is it DPI or first render size? I think it's first render size, but it basically, yeah, it'll it'll check based on the responsive size. Let's see, Jimena saying, I'm out of practice with Age of Empires, but would still love to, and not really want to start playing again. I will say about gaming, that's what I think I loved, or what I love about Fortnite is because at least like with, with the friends I've been playing, it's not about winning. Don't get me wrong. It feels really great to get number one in Battle Royale, to know that you you beat out 100 people. At the same time, though, like it's just nice playing for the sake of playing. <laughs> and that's what lately I've been really trying to get back into, is learning how to get back into a cycle of not only when it comes to playing games, but call it coding, reading, that really the joy and the outcome of it is in the activity itself and not necessarily the output. Because when we, we're bound so closely to outcomes, I think this is often where we have expectations. And I like to say expectation really is the mother of disappointment. And <clears throat> so for that reason, I like to try to really get down to the, the core of the activity and why, why it's important to us and less so about what we get at the end of it. Clearly, I have some typography things to fix in my blog. But in this session, we've, we've learned about Nux Image, the developer experience behind it. And again, I know that people here in the stream, not everyone uses Vue and Nux. And so I say like these ideas aren't, they, like Nux is introducing them, but I don't see why these kind of developer experience patterns shouldn't be passed on to other uh, frameworks as well. Because I can, I can imagine, I, we can't be the only developers who want the ability to just use image optimization at this level and just, and just move on and solve bigger problems, right? Why solve the same thing? Um, over and over again that someone else has already solved. Cassidy, mother of disappointment. That was my nickname in high school. Okay, let's see. Thesis does say when we set for source set, we let the browser decide what image to use. Okay, yeah, that's exactly it. Browser is picking the image based on what they think is best. And man, I'm saying I don't play to win as much as Josh tells me to. Yeah, come go. Da, da, da. Excellent. All right, we've this has been this has been a productive stream. Let me let me flip this over. It looks like things are good. The chat's still showing up for those who are you know joining. So if this uh, if you haven't been in the stream in a little while, I have this new banner on the bottom is which is 100% inspired from Jason's stream as a, a nice little way to differentiate different episodes and sort of also help fill up the screen a little bit for myself because the the ratio on the MacBook Air is not the the standard like 1920 by 1080 that you would expect. It has an extra like. 200 pixels, I think. Hopefully the resolution worked for y'all. And yeah, let's see. So if you're looking for the code that we worked on today, again, my 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 site that I'm building everything on. So if you just want to learn about what's going on and keep track as I modify and make it opinionated, I might even templatize it at some point. I'll drop it in the chat so you can go ahead and use that for your own blog, for example, because I'm based, that's all I'm basically trying to do. Oh, look, Mazadeev saying that Gatsby has it too. Yeah. I think more and more as we continue to develop tooling around coding, it's basically going to boil down to like our ability to make things as easy as possible for people to just move on to the things that really matter, which is trying to create like real world impact and value to customers. And I know it's fun to argue about different developer aesthetics and to always find ways to find, make things more efficient. But just be careful that we we understand the trade-offs of doing that for especially for more production facing applications. I think if you're really interested in that kind of like low level algorithm, like tweaking kind of things, then I think that's the kind of thing where you should definitely look for jobs that are more either in that R and D like lower level field. You should be working at the libraries that provide those abstractions. But I feel like once we get to a point where, particularly with user facing things like e-commerce sites and these kind of things, like things like payment, things like being able to fetch data. There comes a point where we really should try to lower the barrier for developers to not have to do, to basically not just offer them primitives and then be like, good luck, put it together. And so it's why one of the reasons why, for example, I love Obsidian. I love a lot of what we're doing here, but I'd love to also provide people more templates that don't require everyone to always construct things from scratch all the time. And so anyways, some of my developer, philosophy, developer experience philosophy here, but yeah. So with that, I think we're at time. Let's, thanks everyone for hanging out. Okay, so I'm gonna, okay, wait, we're, we're learning from Jason. So a couple of things. One, there actually is a, there is a calendar. Uh, uh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna throw in the, the, I'm a little concerned. Okay, I'm not gonna open up my calendar right now just in case it like shows everything at once. But I, so thesis, I'm very happy to say there, there's, gonna, there's gonna be a calendar going forward. So there will be a schedule in the near future, but on Thursday, 
Let's see, actually, if I go to the Twitch channel, at least I think I have kept it updated there. Yeah, S thanks, John, for coming. Let's see, where is the schedule channel? Wait, where's schedule? Oh, that's so not what I wanted. What did you do? All right, schedule. The schedule is not in here. Okay, <laughs> anyways. Uh, so Thursday, we're going to be doing Obsidian Office Hours again. And excited to do that because I have... I have made some progress on my Telegram workflow. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty great. I've, I've gotten a whole... Dave! I've got this whole Telegram workflow where basically I can press different buttons on... What the heck? This is... This is I'm going to... Do I have, I have time? I'm going to show you a quick demo. All right, hold up. Oh, wait, no, I, I don't I don't think I have the ability. I don't know how to share the phone screen on the desktop just yet. Okay, but basically... Um, using the Telegram widget on the iOS device, you can actually save different... Where's my phone? Oh, this is... Oh, my phone. My phone. I'm literally using my phone for chat. Okay, so let me... Okay, I'm going to open Streamlabs because I don't know what y'all are seeing. All right, here we go. All right, you see this? There you go. All right, you see those like icons I have in the center there? Those represent individual Telegram bots that are responsible for kicking off specific Obsidian workflows. So just as a quick thing, so you see like the checkbox, if I click that and then I, I message Obsidian, remember to get milk or whatever, what that'll do is that'll actually kick off a task workflow to generate everything inside of my Obsidian repo. And there's like a whole thing and it's, it's very neat. And I'm very, very excited about it because it now as I'm going on walks, if I have an idea, I can hit the, the, the light bulb uh, button, toss it in, boom, it'll update it for me. It's very, very cool. Anyhow, we will nerd out on more Obsidian things on Thursday. And let's see, ba -bum -bum. So John is asking, does anyone use? Yeah, so I have a lot of, I have friends in, in Asia who use Line a bit and I've used the interface enough. I like it decently. I think the stickers, I think, aren't as interesting for me. Jimena in the chat's mentioning WhatsApp. I do have a lot of people who use WhatsApp, but I think for those who wanted to separate themselves from like the, the Facebook ownership, Telegram, I think, and Signal both respectively have gotten a huge boost in users, usership. And I will say the plus one for me on the Telegram side is that its bot system is really, really nice. And, and because it has a really great, so I'm going to just show this real quick because I think it's worth showing this. It basically makes it really easy. So here's my, all right, family, here's the link bot. Like you can act, like it has this whole API. So as, as a developer, Telegram has a special place in my heart because it basically allows me to fire off to a link bot whenever it gets a message. And then I can play with it and do things like get the HTML, extract it, create the GitHub file. And then I can actually send back a con confirmation message. I don't think, li oh, Line is here too. So there you go. If you're a Line user, you could do this with Line theoretically. Is WhatsApp in here? No WhatsApp. A signal? No signal. Womp womp. Pieces, you are too kind. Honestly, when it comes to productivity, I think I just, it's more, honestly, it, I just, I, I'm, I'm really, I get bored really quickly. <laughs> I think that's really what it is. And so once I have to do something too too many times, I'm like, there's gotta be a faster way. And that's that's been my drive when it comes to UX. Because for those who don't know, UX design was actually my kind of my original career path. And that's been my driver this entire time. It's just like, how do I make it so I can just get to the point? And so it's why, for example, um, some of you like may have known that the original workflow for N8N was actually like this big if else condition that one bot that you would type like slash URL and if it was slash URL and you pass the link that would trigger the link workflow. I found that that was too slow for me. I did not want to have to spend the time to do slash URL when I was on mobile. And as a result, I, op I wanted to optimize for like how my brain works, which is I got a cool link. I want to send it to the bot. I want to move on with my life. I don't want to have to like configure it to be like, it's a task, it's a thing. So hence the icons on the home screen, the different individual bots for the individual workflows. But we will nerd out on all that stuff on um, Obsidian Office Hours on Thursday. Any key base? I'm not sure what key base you're referring to, Charlie. Oh, Jacob saying signals E2E encryption may prevent APIs. Okay, that, that kind of does make sense. All right, with that, it has been great hanging out with everyone. I am stoked that the MacBook Air has held up on Streamlabs, like under all the Chrome load, the sharing the screen. I think the only thing now, we just got to test a DSLR and we're going to go, hey, plan, you're here. Hey, how's it going? But it's been great. Let's go ahead and find someone to raid, shall we? Let's go ahead and open that up. 
Does oh does N8N have access to Keybase? I can look that up real quick. And nope, I don't see it. Oh wait, let me go to all. Key nope, no Keybase. Sorry, I have to look now that you, okay, I have to look really quick. What is Keybase? I don't know what Keybase is. End to end encryption. Oh yeah, so this um, speaking to Jacob's point, if it the end to end encryption is probably what prevents bots from then getting into that. But it's been a lot of fun hanging out. Let's find someone to raid. Who's online right now? How do I max with this? Here we go. I I guess is there anyone? Oh, recommended channels. Let's see. I don't I don't know too many of these people. Oh. <laughs> All right. We're gonna let's raid let's raid Lana. Oh, how do we do this? I forgot. I gotta. Oh oh oh. I know what I gotta do. I'm gonna stream that and we're gonna raid Lana Lux. Is that her username? All right. And then, thanks everyone. Hope you all have a good day. We're gonna do raid. Oh, do like this. Prime. A okay, let's let's do primogen then. All right, let's let's go. All right, there we go. All right. Thanks everyone for hanging out. It's been fun. Three, two, one. Let's do this. Pew.